On today's show, we shall examine in detail the political implications yeah, of the government reclaiming allegedly grabbed land in the Ruai area. Yeah, and of course, this land belongs to Deputy President William Samoy Ruto. We shall also go scientific today, yeah, because we have often been criticized for conspiracy theories. Yeah, even in those conspiracy theories are actually conspiracy facts. Yeah. People have always said, Chris, where is the scientific proof of what you're saying? Well, today we have it. Doctors and experts across the world have finally spoken. Yeah, and what they have to say <laughs> based on their expertise in science. And then we shall look at the mind-boggling conclusions of an investigative journalist yeah, produced over six years ago yeah, that predict to a T what has unfolded. Yeah, and yet this journalist in his investigations could not see how this thing he was talking about could happen in the near future. But here we are. Yeah, that should also be super fascinating. And as usual, we will start with the politics. <laughs> An essential service in Kenya. Very essential. More essential than water and food. I kid you not. But before that, yeah, some interesting remarks from an ordinary Kenyan. Yeah, who is really pissed off that his livelihood has been taken away. Chris, how what on a pika thubu na popo? So I ask him, popo ni nini? Si popo ni ile bat. How wa chino na pika thubu na popo? So wage kuja ni watengeneze thubu na ngombe. Eh? Sasa hao naletea sisi bala. Hakuna pesa, hakuna kazi. Uwi. Now this Kenyan may be better informed than me. Yeah, because I don't know. Were the Chinese making soup from bats? What? <laughs> anyway, you and me know that this thing has absolutely nothing to do with bats. Yeah. Innocent bats were no never. Yeah, all the blame is being put on bats. At this thing started from a bat. Anyway, let me not get carried away. Let's go into the politics. The very speedy reaction yeah, to the Ruai issue by Kotu Secretary General Francis Atuoli tells us a lot. The first thing he tells us is that this man must have had a heads up. He knew that the government was going to repossess yeah, those 3,000 acres in the rural area. Actually, in my opinion, he was speaking on behalf of the government, yeah, but disguising <laughs> this official statement as his own opinion. Maybe this is what they were discussing yeah, at his Kajado home. Remember that incident we covered on this channel? Maybe this is what they were discussing, or part of what they were discussing that day. Atwali says the 3,000 acres have hampered the expansion of a sewerage plant in the area. And he adds, those responsible should have been arrested a long time ago. And Atwali urged the government to fast track the repossession of public property. Yeah, and bring the perpetrators to book. Yeah, those who have grabbed public property and hampered, yeah, public services. Of course, he didn't name names. Yeah, but it is very clear from this tone <laughs> that he was targeting, yeah, his favorite political punching bag. Yeah, and that's the deputy president. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against the government repossessing grabbed land. No, in fact, that's a great thing. It is the only thing yeah, that has to be done now. And if it is not done now, 
it will be done under unfortunate circumstances in the near future. You know? The way things are going, I'm predicting that will happen. But what I'm against, and what will never stand the test of time, is being selective yeah, when you want to repossess public land that has been grabbed. That can never stand the test of time. Because as soon as you make this thing political, what is going to happen tomorrow is another regime yeah, whose land was uh, repossessed may take over. Yeah, just an example. And what do you think they'll do when they take over? They will take back the land that was repossessed and then they will repossess public land grabbed by their political opponents. Yeah, which in this case is Tim Keleweke. And so that CISO game over public land is not going to help anybody. And indeed, this is our big problem in the fight against corruption. The only way the fight against corruption yeah, can be decisive, can be successful, is if we get ourselves a brand new crop of political leaders because the truth is our current guys are all guilty all of them have done something fishy to get rich it is a clear case of let he who has not sinned throw the first stone yeah and then you get all the political leaders walking away with their heads bent down <laughs> If you want to deal with somebody politically, then deal with him or her politically. Another effective technique to do this is, first of all, to ensure that you and your political supporters and anybody who supports you return everything they've stolen from the public. Yeah? Then you can deal with this other guy properly. Yeah, and with a clean slate yourself. But when you have a fight against corruption that is selective, then you can be sure it will not succeed. And I've given you one example. Because only God knows about tomorrow. You cannot come here and claim to know that this administration, these political leaders, this political class will be here for the next two years let alone the next 20. Where we see Mungu? Yeah, therefore you don't know. Now, I agree with those analysts who have said something shocking about this repossession of the royal land. They have said that this is a game changer. And I agree. And I'll give you the reasons why. We had the Western Hotel issue not too long ago. And people huffed and puffed. People danced around the issue. And finally, nothing happened. The Western Hotel was not demolished. It was not repossessed. Then comes this royal land. Yeah, and for the first time, the government has moved to touch that which belongs to Deputy President William Samuel Ruto. Now, isn't that a game changer? Isn't that something different from what we've seen in the past? And what should be even more fascinating, Deputy President William Samuel Ruto decides, instead of keeping quiet, you know, nobody would have known who the land belongs to. And if they had known, they would have not dared to say. Indeed, initially the newspapers reported that the land belonged to a prominent politician. <laughs> who is a prominent politician? There are so many in the country. But a man called Patrick Osero came out and said, yes, this land belongs to the deputy president. We are not going to contest the repossession because we have a valid title deed for this property. Now, there's no way this one Osero would have come out against the wishes of his boss and talk to the press about this sensitive issue. No way. And therefore it is safe to assume that his boss sent him yeah, 
to give those who had repossessed the land a message. And this was the message. The deputy president has a legitimate title to the property in his house. How can anyone lay claim to it? That, of course, is a legal question, which implies that the owner of the land, 3,000 acres, <laughs> can you imagine that acreage? <laughs> Those are many acres. That implies that the owner of that 3,000 acres is going to contest this legally in the courts. And notice the way he framed it, because he started by saying, the deputy president will not contest the repossession. <laughs> then he goes on to say, he has legitimate title deed to the property, which is in his house. How can anybody lay claim to it? Don't you see there's a contradiction there? What he means is that there's no need to contest it because the deputy president already has the legal ownership of this property. So, last time I checked, the government cannot possess, repossess, private land. This is what this man is saying. In fact, it's a thinly veiled threat. Yeah? Go ahead and let's see how you're going to repossess private land. Because the government repossessing private land has huge implications. First of all, you're telling foreign investors, don't dare buy any land in Kenya. Because the government can repossess it at any time. And now we better understand Atwoli's statement. Yeah. Where he said that the 3,000 acres hampered efforts to expand the sewerage treatment system for Nairobi. Now hold on a minute. How many acres do you need for sewerage system? 3,000? <laughs> no way. <laughs> Obviously, no way. So I think you now understand that already there is a political battle, not even a legal one. There is a political battle. Actually, the Team Keleweke versus Team Tangatanga political duel has now moved to 3,000 acres in Roy. And now it is just a matter of who blinks first. If you want to go into any battle, you choose a battle where you have an advantage. For instance, you can choose to lie your opponents to battle with you when your troops are stationed at the top of the hill, yeah, so that your opponents have to climb to get to you. There you have a clear advantage. Yeah. So in my view, choosing this battlefield with the deputy president is a mistake because Tim Keleweke is allowing their opponents yeah, to do what they do best. And if you doubt this, you can already see the deputy president is on top of the situation. Yeah. The man who looks after his properties is already talking, which tells you he was ready. Yeah, it didn't take him by surprise. And that is not good news for Tim Kelewek. Definitely not. However, I'm informed that Tim Keleweke have a secret weapon in all this. And it is somewhere in the paperwork, yeah, which suggests that the government had already repossessed the ownership of the land, had already reverted to the government yeah, almost 10 years ago. Meaning that if it goes to court, <laughs> there's no case. That's actually what it means if this information I've been given is correct. But we also know something else. We know that Watu Akubwa, big people in Kenya, in the past have not been stopped from developing land yeah, where the paperwork is still hanging, <laughs> questionable. No, that has never stopped them. Because in Kenya, the most important thing is not the legal position. No, it is your political clout, period. And the fact that Patrick Osero, the deputy president's associate, has spoken so early, so quickly, yeah, in this saga, means 
that the deputy president must have a strategy over these 3,000 acres in Roy. And I believe I told you, yeah, I think just this week, that the strategy in the DP Ruto camp has improved dramatically. They have clearly abandoned yeah, their favorite tactic of having somebody like Oscar Sudi issue an abusive and insulting statement yeah, or go on rampage on a press conference, dropping bombshell after bombshell about his perceived political enemies. The deputy president's camp has now decided to play chess. <laughs> oh, yes, which is much more effective. You know, in chess, you can never be sure what the next move by opponent is or is going to be. And you know, before, it was very easy to predict. We do this, the first person to speak will be Oscar Sudi. Then Kipchumba Mukomen will say something. Yeah? And then other Rift Valley members of parliament and politicians will have a major press conference somewhere in Eldoret. And then they'll tell off the government. Yeah, it was very predictable. And then the deputy president will keep quiet. Yeah. All he'll do is call major public rallies in central province, <laughs> the president's home turf. Yeah. And then have his supporters fire all kinds of bubs. Yeah, Tim Keleweke. And then when he stands up to speak, <laughs> he will talk about development and what he's doing to develop the ordinary Kenyan. <laughs> but meanwhile, the message has been delivered. Yeah, because he has not opposed what those people have said. He doesn't have to say it. They have already spoken for him because he's present. He's listening to what they're saying. Yeah, sometimes laughing. <laughs> Which means he's with them. Yeah, so when he stands up and starts speaking about development, and about how this road is going to be built, and that road, and this development project he has opened, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter. Message, imefika. Those were the tactics before. Very predictable. But these new tactics from the deputy president's side, <laughs> if I was in Tim Kileweke, I would start getting worried. Very worried. Even if I have the whole government machinery behind me, I'd still be worried. Now, I appreciate not everybody will agree with my analysis. I know. I know that even some will say that, oh, Chris, you've taken some honey from Sugoi. I know that. I'm aware of that. However, what I do is that I always do my best. I do all my research diligently, and I do my best to deliver the best possible analysis I can deliver at this time. When I was delivering analysis that the deputy president's side didn't like, the deputy president's tactics were wanting. They were predictable. They were playing right into the hands of the opponents. Yeah, so if my analysis came out like it's favoring Tim Keleweke, the reasons were those have given you. But now their tactics have changed. Surely, what do you want me to do? You want me to ignore that? <laughs> and continue shooting barbs for no reason? Yeah? No. I will always give the best possible analysis according to the information I have now at this point of time when I'm making that analysis. And of course, I'm not always right. Yeah, I get it wrong sometimes. But I try my best every time to get it right. And that is my analysis as of today. Tomorrow, nobody knows. You know when you don't have emotions and when you're not supporting any side in particular, you see things which people with emotions can never see. For example, if you went into a boxing ring to fight a very dangerous opponent, usually the strategy is to finish them off in the early rounds. Yeah, because if the fight continues for too long, then the strengths, yeah, the staying power of your opponent kicks in. They have more opportunity to finish you. Yeah? Especially if you came into the fight with surprise tactics. Yeah, you lose the advantage of surprise. 
and they've already read all your moves. They've already read all your tactics for this boxing match. And therefore, winning becomes more and more difficult as the rounds continue to pile up. And this is exactly the situation with the deputy president. Those who wanted to finish him, in my opinion, have lost their best opportunity. Circumstances unfolding on the ground will only make the deputy president stronger. Yeah, that is unfortunate for Tim Kelewake, but it is the truth. Now, let's discuss the global crisis. Not too long ago, some French doctors said that they want to test the vaccine yeah, against this virus, starting with Africa. And we know what happened. <laughs> the backlash was so much yeah, that they had to apologize yeah, and say, we are sorry. We take back what we said. Now, hot in the heels of that, in Oxford, in the United Kingdom, some other professors have now come out and said that they're going to start their tests in Kenya, not even Africa. They've been very specific. We're going to start these vaccine tests in Kenya. Ministry of Health officials in Kenya have said they don't have that information. Yeah, they're not aware that tests for any vaccine are going to take place in Kenya. But those who understand how things work in Africa will know that that denial means nothing. These deals are usually done in private, behind closed doors. Yeah, and then they even strategize how they're going to quietly introduce it yeah, so that any opposition is dealt with. But I love the response yeah, that has been attributed to Martha Karua, party leader of the NAC party. Yeah, and I was not able to verify by the time I started making this recording whether the remarks really came from her. But what is important are the remarks. Yeah, and the remarks were, fine, very good. Let these people come and start their vaccine tests in Kenya. No problem. However, let them start with the cabinet secretaries and their families and all the important people in government. Let the vaccine tests start with those ones. <laughs> and I would add, and especially the politicians who are very quiet during this crisis, even as people start their evil agendas against Africa, our politicians are very quiet. The issues they're supposed to be raising, what they're supposed to be talking about, is being raised by ordinary Kenyans yeah, on social media. What a shame. So let the test start in Parliament and in the Senate and amongst the governors and their families. Yeah? Let those ones be tested first. Yeah, then the rest of us ordinary people will observe how they behave for about two years and then the test can proceed to us. Perfect solution. Don't you agree? <laughs> yani, when anybody comes with anything new and after they finish testing the mice and the monkeys and the other animals, the first place they think of is Africa. Let's go and test it in Africa. Aye? And that is despite the fact that this virus has not touched Africa. Yeah? We remain unscathed. All we are hearing is that the next two weeks will be crucial. The next week will be crucial. Prepare for bad news. Prepare for bodies on the streets of Africa. That's all we are hearing. But it's not happening. And it has definitely reached that point where if it happens now, we will know it is not natural. It is artificial. You know, this saga is just bizarre. Flu is not a problem in Africa. Yeah, in the West, it kills many people. Yeah. In the US, for instance, it kills over 60,000 Americans every year. They even have a flu season. Yeah. But here in Africa, go to the village and tell somebody flu. What's that? We have different problems. Pneumonia, for instance, is serious in Africa. Yeah, that one we understand. But this flu thing is foreign. 
I'm not saying people don't catch the flu in Africa, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it is not a major issue in Africa. It's not. Yeah. Of course, people have been trying to force it to be a major issue in Africa for years. Like in Mekata. Oh, yes. So you have your own disease in your countries. And then you want to come and do the first tests in Africa. Oh, boy. That doesn't make any sense. Or you believe Africans are still stupid. They don't understand these things. They want to know what is happening. <laughs> well, my simple message to these racists yeah, is prepare yourselves very well to deal with a very different Africa. In case there are any leaders you have bribed, you yeah, are given money to do your things, you'd better go and get your money back. Oh yes, I'm giving you free advice. Especially if you want to test a vaccine yeah, that has to do with this virus in Africa. <laughs> Think again. You know there's one major difference between Africa and the West. In Africa, we believe in God. When you go up country, even if you don't go to church, your parents tell you, let us pray before you go back. In Africa, we talk a lot about God Almighty. Yeah. Of course, some of us go to the West, yeah, and they find uh, different things in the West, and therefore they assume not talking about God is development, is being sophisticated. Yeah, just don't mention God all the time. After all, God was brought by the whites to colonize the Africans. Yeah, stick to your own traditional beliefs, traditional religions. Yeah, that's a sophisticated African. Ha 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 ha. Anyway, my point is we talk a lot about God. And we read our Bibles. And when we forget, street preachers remind us. Preachers in our matatus remind us. And we know very well about something called the mark of the beast. Therefore, Anybody who wants to test a vaccine for this virus in Africa, all I can say to them, good luck. Because yes, Africans may be backward, they may be stupid, they may be poor. However, they read their Bible. Jaribu, jaribu nitu, mtajua hamjui. Now, let's look at what other scientists are saying across the world. Yeah. Doctors have come out in the United States and they have said that the data given by Bill Gates and company, the predictive contagion model, was all wrong, exaggerated. None of that data was correct. And by the way, a lot of the data they were using is available online. So maybe you can check out the data for yourself and see whether what they are saying is correct. Or the scientists themselves are wrong. They are saying that this virus has millions of people infected. Yeah, that is true. Millions are infected. But, and this is the key part, only a small number of deaths. Very small in comparison to the number of people infected. Bottom line, it is not a pandemic. It does not justify the draconian lockdowns yeah, which have been implemented right across the world. It doesn't. It doesn't justify taking away people's livelihoods. It doesn't. Now, one doctor gave a very interesting example. Yeah, he compared two Nordic countries, Sweden and Norway. Norway went into a lockdown. Sweden did not. And guess what? Same results. Yeah, give or take, a little here and there, but same results, more or less the same thing. You take the number of people infected, total number of people who have tested positive, versus the tests you've done, and you create a percentage for the whole country, and you're assuming dash percent in the whole country have the virus. And then you look at the number of deaths in comparison to that big figure you have, and of course in comparison to your population. Most of the times, the fatality rate comes to 0.00 something. Worst case scenario, like in New York, 
it comes to 0.1, still a very minute fraction, which confirms once again that the agenda here is not the virus. It is something else. Now, many people have gotten me wrong. They shoot back and say, oh, Chris, you're not taking this virus seriously. You're telling people it doesn't exist. What? Did I say it doesn't exist? Of course it does. And of course, people have lost their lives. But it is not the pandemic the World Health Organization claims it is. It is not. The scientific data now proves that beyond any reasonable doubt. It's conclusive. Wake up. Now, this investigative journalist. Now, I'm going to play you snippets yeah, from the video recorded from an interview he did some years back. Yeah, just listen. I'll be back in a bit. The ruling establishment has a lot of... They, they will stop at nothing to complete their toolkit of control, right? So one of the things that has been missing from the toolkit of total control has been quarantines and curfews, right? Mm -hmm. So now, welcome to the new world. If the ruling class ever saw yeah. wide-scale civil unrest, you'd see an Ebola outbreak in America right away. Okay, so this is, what you see is that Ebola is... Another tool in the toolbox of the ruling of class repression control. To, yeah, of, to keep down Absolutely, repression. positively, 100%. This is a tool. Right. Yeah, Ebola doesn't just magically start spreading. Mm -hmm. And then we have this doctors that come back here. The white people, of course, live. Mm -hmm. you know, the two whites who got it or survived. Mm -hmm. All the black people that get it die. Uh, the white. It's very possible that uh, these uh, NG, one of one of these NGOs over there is going around uh, with a veil of uh, Ebola or spreading it from a small plane onto villages. The point is, is to get hundreds of thousands of people infected with it and uh, create uh, the next phase of control. Now, one of the things I'd like to show to back up my, uh, uh, my claims here uh, here's a document from the uh, Rockefeller Foundation. Rockefeller Foundation, right there. Oh, you can oh, zoom in yeah. on that, where my finger is. It's called Scenarios for, for the Future International Development, the Rockefeller Foundation. All right. Okay, let's take a look at what they're saying here. This is uh, something like a 50, 60 page document. I'd like to, you to go to uh, page 18, if you can look at this up on the internet, but I'll read it off to you. It's called lockstep, lockstep. And this is a, a phrase that I used uh, right after 2001 when I saw the entire system of the United States, including the population, were in lockstep. Uh, so the Congress went along, and yes, it was Osama bin Laden, and the people waved their flag and said, I hate, 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 and everything was in lockstep. Well, in 2010, uh, they published this, Rockefeller Foundation, and here's what they're saying. They're saying that uh, it's, they call it a scenario. These are scenario narratives, and they speak about it in the past tense. So they put out this scenario, lockstep. A world of tighter, top-down government control and more authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback. Okay, I'll read a, a little bit of it. In 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years, nobody was anticipating a pandemic, finally hit. Unlike 2009's N1 H, uh, H1N1, uh, this new influenza strain uh, originating from wild geese, they use wild, they use some scenario, but this is Ebola they're yeah, talking yeah, about. Ahead. Even the most pandemic prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million in just seven months, the majority of them healthy young adults. The pandemic also had a deadly effect on economies. You, you can see the you can see the agenda, just naked, raw, naked control agenda written down, and it's anybody's guess how this becomes effectuated in real life. So whether this is written specifically as marching orders or whether people take it upon themselves in the intelligence networks to say, okay, well, this has been produced, so this is the plan here. But these narratives have to be written in advance because the intelligence agencies don't know how to do this, these narratives. They need help. So the, these think tanks, they come up with these like Rand Corporation, Rockefeller Foundation. These are think tanks of death. They're not the think tanks, they're not there to find great ways to help people. 
Okay, the pandemic also had a deadly effect on economics. International mobility of both people and goods screeched to a halt. Right? which is what they want. They want a completely isolated world, right? Debil debilitating industries like tourism and breaking global su supply chains. Well, of course they want tourism stopped because they don't, they're not in the tourism business and they want you at home in your house in front of the TV. Then they got you because once you watch the TV, they, they own your soul. Even locally. Wait a second, we're on television. I mean commercial television, let's say. Uh, national, uh, even locally, uh, normally bustling shops and offices sat empty for months. Okay, so th I love how they talk about it in the past tense in 2010. Right? The pandemic blanketed the planet, though disproportionate numbers in Africa died, <laughs> Southeast Asia, and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire. It sounds like the opening uh, monologue of a disaster movie, right? Exactly. Now listen, to, here's the good stuff now. But even in developed countries, containment was a challenge. Now here's this one. I love this one. The United States initial policy of strongly discouraging, in quotation marks, strongly discouraging citizens from flying proved deadly in its leniency. So they're saying, oh, so they're saying that... No, keep going. Okay, read it. Just proved read it. deadly in its leniency. Leniency. So they should have been tougher, right? Accelerating the spread of the virus, not just within the United States, but across borders. However, a few countries did fare better. China in particular. The Chinese government's quick imposition and enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, as well as its instant and near hermetic sealing off of all borders, saved millions of lives, stopping the spread of virus far earlier than in other countries. So the message is here is we have to look towards the Chinese, the oppressive totalitarian, totalitarian. Yeah, Chinese regime as an example of what we, we need to be doing here. And of course, the ruling class here loves the Chinese. Chinese regime because they have the, they have demonstrated to the ruling class the most efficient form of author capitalism, which is, which is authoritarian capitalism. So we have capitalism, but unfortunately we have this like veil. I get it. We have some this veil this of democracy. It's, this is yeah. very interesting. This is, continue on. Please. Okay, uh, okay. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their muscles, flexed their authority, and imposed airtight rules and restrictions. You can see the agenda. Hey, no, go, 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 go. Okay. From the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entries to communal spaces like uh, That's what's happening right trained, now. Yeah, but soon it's going to be like body, you know. I, it's It'll not, be at the subway? Yeah. They, they, well, Is that what you're saying? We'll be going through this in the oh, subway to get on buses absolutely, and the subway? Absolutely. Things positively. like that. And, and what, what this means, though, is, you know, don't, don't think about having a, you know, a cigarette, a joint on you. Or, you know, I mean, basically, you can't. This is a, a dragnet for everything. So, if if in order for you, oh, in to, other words, just like with stop and frisk, this is ultimate stop and frisk. This is the this ultimate is cavity stop and frisk, cavity search kind of thing. All right. So during the pandemic, national leaders around there flex their authority. You know, they're 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 they're, they're uh, now. There's some good stuff. Listen to this. Uh, and even supermarkets, they want uh, body checks at supermarkets. Okay. So basically, what they're saying is they're building a system where Every move you make, you, you got to go through them. You okay. can't get food. Can't well, how get about food. if you go to the farmer's market? Right. Here's the good stuff now. I mean, it just keeps getting better. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified. That's the whole point. So they're going to get rid of... Did that happen already with 9-11? Uh, of course. 9-11 was how many? 14 years sure. ago? And sure. we still have all these uh, draconian rules. So they're going to put the body cavity USA searches Patriot in. USA Patriot and That's all That's right. Of so in order to get to a supermarket, you got to have a body cavity search. And then when there's no more evil, evil uh, well, you know what? We kind of like this way because we have an in complete infrastructure of uh, a mm. control grid. Like, in order pr to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems, from pandemics <clears throat> and national terrorism to environmental crisis and rising poverty, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. Well, what the hell would rising poverty have anything to do with imposing strict uh, citizen controls with face masks. Right? So they're very sloppy stuff here. Uh, at first, the notion of a more controlled world gained wide acceptance and approval. I'm sorry, 
Nobody likes this stuff. Can, They're can, just can you saying un- it. Sit in, no, I, I have to. I have yeah, to. I have no, to provide no, no, analysis. No, no, only because we only have five minutes left. So that's. Oh my why. God. Okay. Citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy to more paternalistic states in exchange for greater safety and stability. I mean, that's just a, a that's just a complete naked contradiction to the famous saying that if you think you're going to give up a little bit of uh, security, I mean, if you want, if you're going to give up your freedom for security, you're going to get neither. That's the long standing thing. And here what they're doing is they're not even ashamed or embarrassed to absolutely say the exact opposite. They're saying, yes, we all want to give up our, our privacy and sovereignty for more stability and security and stability. So you don't get that. When you give it up like that, you get the shaft. That Can you show us the, t- the cover again of I'll what you were just reading? One more just, time and then I have this two is more what, documents. Right, this two is more what documents. we were reading here and just zoom in a little bit so folks can see it. He'll zoom in. Don't worry. You can relax. Right. And scenarios for the future of technology and international development. Okay. Now, now I have two more documents. Keep it zoomed. We have the National Security Memorandum of December 10th, 1974. This is Henry Hold Kissinger's down. brainchild. The National Security Memorandum number 200. You can look that up on your internet. Internet. I'll summarize it. He says that there's too many people. We got to get rid of the population. So if, to answer your question, oh, from earlier. Yeah, yeah. He says he used the word depopulation, which is different. Depopulation means killing people that already exist, and it's to get the minerals because we need the minerals. And here's another one. The CDC has a patent on Ebola. They patented it. Yeah? Oh, really? So basically, if you want to get a cure for your Ebola. Uh, you here it says go it right up here, right? It says human Ebola virus species and compositions and methods thereof, and it's a patent. It's a patent. Uh, they uh, patented the main strain plus something like 17 other strains of it. So they own it now, and I don't know how exactly you can own that, but apparently they've, they've done the same thing. Yeah, I didn't think you could own a natural... Yeah, you can. They've, uh, I guess the main thing to, 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 to finish off this show is this, that... Um, uh, that um, they want to get more control, more cur- and it's and it's going to be curfews and quarantine. So what I'm saying is that unless the American people start to get some new um, way to uh, revolt, to, uh, a new way to organize, new way to protest, new uh, in, unless they, we can break through the uh, ap- apathy, because that's what we have here, mm-hmm. uh, then it's going to be a slave state here. The ruling class doesn't seem to have too much resistance. They're getting everything on their Christmas. Uh, shopping list, and they've been wanting quarantines and curfews for a long time. Now they got it. And and if you want to live in a world where you're tricked into all this stuff because it's for your safety, right? And if you want to have a probe and make sure you got to check your pockets, make sure you don't have anything incriminating on you before you go out. And and when you step out of your house, you want some police there to monitor and see what you're doing. If that's the world you want to live in, be apathetic. Don't do anything. You're going to get that world very soon. It's coming your way, definitely. Mm -hmm. So what should people do? What's the hope? You have 30 seconds. To wake up, learn about it and go fight these bastards in Washington. They're easy to beat. If we can just organize, we can beat them. It's simple. They're weak, and there's so few of them. What? I don't think I need to add anything more. What this means is that this plan was written somewhere before it happened, long before it happened. And that means it was not an accident. This thing has been planned for a long time, for certain objectives. Notice what also they say about Africa. Yeah. The West are just interested in the resources there. Nothing else. <laughs> and some of us here are still falling into the trap of the Westerners and their agenda. Still supporting them. Hey, Chris, you're talking rubbish. Yeah. Listen to the experts from the West. That's what I've been told. <laughs> well, we now know What these experts you trust so much have been planning for Africa all along. Yeah, and their own citizens, indeed. And so, if you still want to approach this thing, yeah, with your eyes wide open, and yet you're not seeing, Shauriako, you cannot be helped. And this is a wake-up call for Africa. We have no other option but to unite now. Yeah, our leaders are not going to do it. We need to unite now and force unity amongst our leaders as we speak in one voice. And we need to do this like yesterday before it is too late. 
before people yeah, get their agenda fulfilled in Africa. You notice the guy says many people will die in Africa <laughs> more than in the West. Did you hear that? No wonder these guys are wondering why Africans are not dying. In fact, they're upset. They're annoyed. You Africans, what's wrong with you? Why are you not dying? Why? Why are you not dying in large numbers? You guys are really messing us up. Die! <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekuja. Thank you.